Welcome to our lecture series on DNA, RNA, and the human genome. In this chapter, you will become familiar with the structures of the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Discover how chromosomes are packaged within the cell and learn about the sequencing of the human genome. In this first section, we will cover the structure of DNA and RNA. Nucleic acids are one of the four major types of macromolecules that are central for all known forms of life. The nucleic acids consist of two major macromolecules, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, shown here, and ribonucleic acid, RNA, that contain the genetic instructions for the development of an organism. The DNA macromolecule is composed of two polynucleotide chains that coil around each other to form a double helix. DNA is a polymer that is made up of monomer building blocks called nucleotides. Nucleotides can be broken down into three components, a sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. The sugar used in creating RNA molecules is ribose. The numbering of the carbon atoms in a sugar molecule starts on the anomeric side of the molecule, or the carbon position, where the carbon is bound to two oxygen molecules. In the case of ribose, this is carbon one prime. This is followed by the two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime positions. Deoxyribose is used as the core for DNA monomers. The deoxy position is located at the two prime carbon. This small structural difference creates many of the physical differences between RNA and DNA molecules, including things like degradation susceptibility. The core structure of a nucleic acid monomer is the nucleoside, which consists of the sugar residue and a nitrogenous base that is attached to the sugar at the one prime position. When phosphates are attached to the unit, the building block is called a nucleotide with a T. The mnemonic that I use to help me remember this is that a nucleoside has a side of sugar, whereas a nucleotide is the total monomer. Note that the phosphate groups are attached to the five prime carbon position hence the name 5-prime phosphate that you might already be familiar with. The 3-prime hydroxyl group is the position where two nucleotides will be linked together when building a molecule of DNA or RNA. Nucleotides can exist as monophosphates, as diphosphates, or as triphosphates. The triphosphate form is the building block that will be used for RNA and DNA synthesis. The trinucleotide here would be used for RNA synthesis as the sugar is ribose and contains the two prime hydroxyl group. For the DNA molecule, there are four nitrogenous bases that are incorporated into the standard DNA structure. These include the purines, adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines, cytosine and thymine. RNA uses the same nitrogenous bases as DNA, except for thymine. Thymine is replaced with uracil in the RNA structure. The red lines indicate where each nucleotide is attached to the sugar molecule. Note that the purines adenine and guanine each have nine in their name. I think this is a useful way to remember that they are the purines or the bases that have two ring structures. Note that the two ring structures have nine adjacent atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is in comparison to the pyrimidines, which contain six-membered rings. I like to link cytosine with the Y and thymine with the Y to the pyrimidines with the Y. Hopefully, this will help you identify them a little more easily. You will need to know how to recognize each of these bases by sight. To further distinguish adenine from guanine, I use the alphabet. A comes before G 
and N comes before O. Notice that adenine only contains nitrogens in the ring structure, whereas guanine contains oxygen. It also contains more nitrogen as well, but it is the presence of oxygen that I look for to identify guanine. For cytosine and thymine, I use a similar strategy. C comes before T in the alphabet, and notably, cytosine contains a nitrogen that extends off of the ring structure. Thymine only contains oxygen that extends off the ring structure. Note now that thymine also contains a methyl group, CH3. This methyl group can help you distinguish thymine from uracil. That is the only difference between them. You can then distinguish cytosine from uracil by the nitrogen contained in the cytosine. Practice identifying these residues. You will need to know them for the exam. This is just a reminder that you've already seen ATP or adenosine triphosphate from chapter one. Notice that it is the same building block used in RNA synthesis. Many of the nucleotides have dual functions within the cell. They are nucleic acid building blocks, but they also serve as cofactors in enzyme reactions providing the needed energy to drive the reaction forward. When nucleotide triphosphates are incorporated into the nucleic acid structures, two of the phosphate groups are cleaved off, leaving the nucleotide monophosphate as the nucleic acid building block. During nucleic acid biosynthesis, nucleotides are incorporated in a directional manner. They can only be added to the 3' hydroxyl side of the nucleic acid strand. This is true for both DNA and RNA. The 3' hydroxyl of the nascent strand mediates nucleophilic attack on the phosphorus of the first phosphate position. This causes the other two phosphates to serve as a leaving group. The further hydrolysis of the diphosphate to the monophosphate releases energy that drives the synthesis reaction forward. This energy release provides a barrier that keeps the reaction from moving in the reverse direction. Thus, the growing nucleotide is always built in the five prime to three prime direction. Five prime, three prime. Remember, five prime phosphate, three prime hydroxyl. The overall DNA structure forms a double helix, where two separate strands of DNA align with each other in a regular twisting pattern. Notable features about the double helix is that the two strands lie in anti-parallel direction, or head to tail, with the five prime side of one strand aligning with the three prime side of the other strand. The DNA bases also face inward towards the center of the helix, where they form hydrogen bonds that hold the helix together. In DNA, the adenine base always pairs with the thymine base, forming two hydrogen bonds, whereas guanine always pairs with cytosine, forming three hydrogen bonds. The structural elements of the DNA double helix form repeating three-dimensional features in the helix, most notably the formation of the major and the minor grooves, inherent to the nature of the AT and GC base pairing. Here you can see that the major groove is much larger than the minor groove, and that a major groove is always flanked by a minor groove on the other side of the helix such that if you could see the other side of this helix, there would be a major groove back here and a minor groove behind here. The major and minor grooves and minor variations found within them due to specific nucleotide sequences provide unique protein binding sites for transcription factors to recognize and bind in a very sequence specific manner. Depending on the hydration level of the DNA, and on regional sequence patterns, different forms of the double helix can arise. These include the A form, or A DNA, the B form, or B DNA, and the Z form, or Z DNA. Both the A and the B forms of the double helix are right-handed spirals. 
with the B form being the predominant form found in vivo. The A form helix arises when conditions of dehydration below 75% of normal occur and have mainly been observed in vitro during X-ray crystallography experiments when the DNA helix has become desiccated. The A form of the double helix can occur in vivo when RNA adopts double-stranded conformations or when RNA and DNA form complexes. The Z form of the DNA is a left-handed helix that is found rarely within DNA sequences, but highlights the flexibility of the DNA structure. Within the B DNA structure, approximately 10 base pairs are required for one turn of the helix. Because the DNA bases contain a lot of nitrogen and oxygen, they are fairly reactive and can be chemically and physically modified by interaction with external chemicals and proteins. This can lead to the regulation of DNA processes such as transcription and translation, but it also can lead to unwanted DNA modifications. The diagram on the left shows some of the structural modifications that can occur when DNA interacts with foreign, chemically reactive molecules. These can include shifts such as base tilting, rolling, sliding, twisting, and even flipping. For example, intercalating agents are molecules that can slide in between DNA bases and are shown here in blue. When compared with the normal helical structure shown in B, intercalating agents can alter the length in between bases and distort or elongate the major and minor groove structures. Other agents may react by covalently binding with the DNA bases. When this happens, the resulting lesion is called a DNA adduct, shown here in blue. DNA adducts can cause the helix to bend, or it can cause base flipping, or even regional opening of the double helix. Lesions within the DNA can alter the ability of transcription to occur and potentially lead to the formation of sequence mutations if the DNA is replicated while lesions are present. In the next lecture, we will talk about how the double helix is packaged and protected within the nucleus of the cell to minimize the formation of these types of damaging lesions.